just recently the Lego company announced a record profit of 31%. I mean, for most of us, we probably will say, well, that's nothing. I mean, every kid plays with Lego today, so of course they are so successful. But if you wind back time 13 years to 2003, you'll notice that the story was completely reversed. In 2003, uh, Lego was actually close to bankruptcy. And at that stage, um, they realized that kids really couldn't care less about physical play. What they wanted to do instead was to go digital. They wanted to play computer games. They thought Nintendo was more fun. And that made Lego become pretty obsolete. Some of the biggest studies Lego conducted back then was basically telling them that the instant gratification generation had arrived. Uh, basically, it meant that kids wouldn't have time to play with those Lego bricks. So as a consequence of that, Lego decided to change the size of the Lego bricks from those tiny bricks to gigantic building blocks, reducing the construction time of a Lego castle from a couple of days to a couple of hours. Now this story actually begins, and this true story begins in 2003 up to Christmas. Uh, because at that stage, the sales go down to 30%. At that stage, Lego is going into panic, and a small breakout group within Lego hears about this, goes into panic, and decides to rebel against what has happened. So what they do is to visit consumers in their homes across Europe. They enter a small home in Germany, an 11-year-old kid's home, They're sitting in the bedroom with permission from the parents, and they ask the kid one simple question. What are you most proud of? And the kid pauses for a second and he points at the shelf where he has an old worn down, worn down pair of sneakers. He takes them down, the smelly, and he says these ones. And the little team is puzzled. Why, why, do, why do you do that? And he says, well, because they are my evidence that I'm the best skater in town. You see, when you slide down a skateboard, it creates a wear and tear on the side of the sole of those shoes. And this has become his trophy, because exactly that wear and tear means he was number one. And that was the second where Lego had a wake-up call. They realized, gee, we completely misunderstood the situation. In fact, the idea of the time is in essence is completely obsolete for those kids, because the reality is, if you put them in the driver's seat of things, time is not in essence. And as a consequence of that, they changed the size of those gigantic building blocks back to the tiny bricks. They even added more of the small bricks to the boxes. And they did a little trick as well. They began developing the Lego movie. This is a story about being present. As crazy as it sounds, the fact is that in our world today we're not present anymore. I mean, I'm not sure if you can agree with me, but how many of you have tried? You're standing in a bar, you're waiting for someone to show up, the person did not show up on time, right? And then you grab your phone and do something with it, anything with it just to look like you're not a loser, right? <laughs> Raise your hand if you've done that. Well, exactly. So what happens? What is the consequence of that? The consequence really is that we are not seeing the word anymore. I mean, we put this cover on our head, and then we sort of distance ourselves from the world. And I've learned one thing. Creativity happens when you're completely bored. And I've learned one thing. The biggest source of inspiration for creativity is when you start to see the world. Yet what we do right now is to hide behind the screen with huge and very comfortable distance to the real world. A good example of that is, is really how data sometimes can manipulate our perception of the world. I mean, one example would be an American bank which just recently announced that um, they had a problem. They had too much churn in the bank. People are changing around with all the bank accounts, right? And they thought they were losing all the customers because of this. So the management wrote this amazing letter to all the customers apologizing and giving them a really good deal so they could come back. But just before they were shipping all those letters out, one guy said, hey, we should pause for a second. So he started to talk to those people, the customers, 
had an interaction with them and realized the reason why they're leaving was not because they were unhappy, it was because they were just going through a divorce. So the majority actually was still happy, you just needed to approach them in a different way. It was basically think about why do we see the world so differently between those data? Because the reality is today we're so hooked up on all those data, the big data phenomenon. But every day, there's something much more valuable in front of us. That's what I define as small data. In 2012, Google had a really big breakthrough. They realized that by analyzing the search terms, for example, people typing in flu, they were able to predict a flu outbreak five or six days before it would happen. Fantastic. The medical community thought this is a breakthrough, and it was pretty good because it means that you can warn, warn the medical community and the pharmaceutical companies about this incident so they could deliver the goods in time. But just recently, the Center for Disease Control announced that Google had been completely wrong. In fact, the numbers they had supplied were two times off what they should have been. You see, when I type in flu and my neighbor comes by and he types in flu as well, oh, you have a flu, I want to check out what the flu, that's interesting. And suddenly this became viral. What Google were looking at was the correlation of data. What they forgot was the power of the causation. But big data is all about the correlation. Small data, as I call it, these seemingly insignificant observations, as I write in my book, was it really happening all around us is all about causation, the reason why. Every day I sleep with consumers. I move into the homes and I spend time in the homes. Sometimes I visit the homes, sometimes I'm staying overnight. And I've done that 2,000 times over the last decade. It's an amazing experience. An experience which makes you wake up. But it's also an experience which makes you realize that at a subconscious level as human beings, as we expose so much for information in consumer homes, you can start to draw parallels. In fact, what you can do is you can start to look through walls. It sounds crazy, but you actually can. Sometimes I catch myself in being able to almost predict what the color of the wall is in the neighborhood bedroom. I've never been there. I just feel it. What I've realized is that as you are present, you actually can start to see things about people which they don't even know. Just like an investigator would uh, pick up a nail and a hair and based on that tell you about your situation, I pick up what I call emotional DNA. The way a hang painting is hanging, the way you place your shoes or the way you brush your teeth is all revealing inside about who you really are, your personality. We have, for example, Facebook. And I'm sure most of you would say that the Facebook account you have is pretty honest, that's who you are. But when you think about it, you will know it's one big lie. It protects who you would like to be seen as. The ideal person is your color brochure, really. You curate it very carefully. And what's really fascinating is if you mirror that into your home, exactly the same is happening. In your home, we have something which I call a perception room. It is your staged room, and if you're curious to figure out where your perception room is, you can just look for where you placed your coffee table book. There you have the perception room. <laughs> and what I noticed is that those people, and I hope I'm not offending anyone here, but those people always have huge paintings hanging on the wall, typically very colorful, have a pretty good self-confidence. Though on return, those people are having a huge shelf with tons of books stacked in the perception room, may I add. Well, they didn't have the most solid education in life. In fact, they feel they want to compensate for the lack of education they had when they were younger. Sounds crazy, right? But our life is all about being in balance. And we all, you and I included, are out of balance. The nation can be out of balance. Take Syria. The refugee crisis is a good example of that, how a whole population is skating up because the country is out of balance. But you and I is out of balance too. I mean, either we don't feel we are we're popular enough, we don't have enough friends, it may be I feel overweight, it may be I feel that I've hit my midlife crisis at 40. We're out of balance. 
A brand, a service, or a product opportunity happens in that gap between being in balance and out of balance. It's that gap which is creating a point of differentiation. The issue is with big data that they predict the past, they accumulate the past and celebrated our success or what we did well. But how can you predict the past and the future at the same time? Well, that's where these small data comes into play. And these seemingly insignificant observations are defining the human touch of things. Just as an example, I mean, how many of you, when you caught your girlfriend or your boyfriend or found her for the first time, were sort of saying, I really love her because she is six feet seven tall. And the color of her pantone, her pantone color hair is pantone color 5529. And, and the four last digit of her cell phone number is 1015. It really turns me off. <laughs> we don't, right? Emotions are strings. And as I've realized all the time is that once we find that emotional gap, that's where things are having a difference. A couple of years ago, a, a major fashion chain approached us and, and asked us if we could turn them around. They had a problem. They asked all the customers, using all the usual research methodologies about their satisfaction rate. And people loved the brand, they loved the product. It was fantastic. Oh, what problem? Sales were going down. <laughs> so, we did the usual stuff. I moved in with girls. You know, that's my job. <laughs> I get paid for it, we get permission, of course, but I do the work of sitting on the bed and talking and listening and observing. Oh, strange, because I'll, I'll never forget this. An average girl today are waking up 23 minutes earlier than she did just 10 years ago. In fact, a bedroom has completely changed, I realized. Girls no longer have a desk. In fact, desk manufacturers around the world are going broke right now because they live and breathe in the bed. They live, they talk, they sleep, they eat, they do the homework in the bed. What we realize is even the pillow and cushion manufacturers are changing the entire design. I spoke to a manufacturer in Poland. They completely changed the design of the cushions because you sit differently in a bed than what you did 10 years ago. But as we started to do the research in the home, I was puzzled about one thing. What are they using the 23 minutes on? So I started to do my job. I went to the bathroom, as you do, and checked out the shower cabin and realized the shampoo bottle had changed in size over the last 10 years. In particular, the hall was smaller than it was 10 years ago. I went to the drawers. I saw that the hand cream had changed from being water-based to oil-based. The facial cream was no longer oil-based, it was water-based. And they used more of this facial powder. Why? We paused a little bit about this, and then we went back to our drawing board, and we sort of said, what is this all about? And then one second it struck me, yes, of course. You see, when you wake up in the morning as a girl, let's say 15 years of age, your fingers are very dry, right? But you had to use your cell phone, right? Because that's the first thing you touch in average as a girl when you're 15 years of age. You can't use it when you have dry fingers. So you need to use oil-based cream, right? On your hands, which is what they did. Which made us realize, yeah, of course, the first thing they use is to use is the phone. But then it's stopped here, what, what are they doing with those phones? Of course, when you use oil-based facial cream, your skin is shining. That's the reason why it's changed into water-based, because it's not shining as much. That's the reason why they're using facial powder, because they take the shine away, so they can take a selfie. <laughs> and not just one selfie. As we started to do our research work, going back to the big data to find the, the correlation of things, with permission from the parents, we realized that they're not taking one selfie in the morning. An average girl in Europe is taking 17 selfies every morning. <laughs> Why? I want to pause for a second because what I've realized is that people talk about transparency. That is sort of the big thing. Everything should be transparent. I couldn't disagree more. I believe that transparency is bad. 
I'll tell you why. When I was a kid, when I was in school, let's say 15 or 16 years of age, I had 23 friends in school. And when we went to the exam, I had 23 competitors. I knew who they were. I could see how well I was doing. Today, an average kid, 15 years of age, would have, let's say, 250 million competitors. And there's no way you can ever be number one. You'll always be down at the bottom, no matter how good you are. The issue is that communities have become so big, the competition is so big, that our level of self-confidence is completely going down. And what we see every day as we visit homes across Europe and the world is these young kids and their self-esteem level is down the drain. But why do I tell you about that? Because at the end of the day, we need to understand the importance of transparency as we build brands. Girls have changed their behavior when they go out and shop. They change their behavior in such a way that they're no longer looking at things as a single standing person. They go in as groups. Uh, just recently, we went across the US to interview booksellers and observe girls as they are buying books. You know, books, the one, there's no battery in them, it's just the, you know, the physical ones. And what I realized was that when girls were buying books in the past, they would go in single standing, they would separate, they would pick the books they like and go back and buy them, right? No, that's not the case anymore. Today, girls would go in as a group, five girls at a time, typically. They will basically be attracted by the most messy table, the one looking most like, let's say, Instagram. Chaos, with lots of stuff on it. And then each of the girls would read on the back of the book, nicely, and read it, and they would pitch the book to each other. And if every single girl around them would like the book, that girl would buy the book. So you can see how we're changing. Now what does that have to do with transparency? Well, the reason why the girls are taking those selfies is to color coordinate the clothes they're wearing to school. Because you don't want to feel alone, you want to feel like a tribe, a group, you want to feel safe. And that safety comes back to the way girls are buying stuff. So I went back to this retailer and said to them, hey, of course, if you're taking 17 selfies of yourself every day in the morning, you're running out of clothing options very quickly. So we need to introduce two more seasons, so we have six seasons a year. But I also realized that they're shopping differently. So we went into, the, into these dressing rooms. And again, remember, that's my job, to observe girls going to dressing rooms, right? <laughs> so I was sitting there, like um, an old sleazy man, I guess, <laughs> observing them walking in and out. And now they were not walking as one girl at a time. They were walking in groups of five and six. So we had to change the entire size of the dressing rooms, right? Which were the problem, because right now they're too small. And having this transparency in mind, that self-confidence issue of being validated all the time, I decided to say, why don't we install one big screen in the back of each of the dressing rooms? You press a button. With permission, you put in your Facebook password. Your friends are appearing. You drag them into your inner group, those you'd like to ask a question. You take a photo in the room, and they will now send you a vote on what clothes they like to wear. 17% like that handbag, those shoes, they're dreadful. Get rid of them, it's only 2% with likes. <laughs> Sales like that, or no? This is a story about how these seemingly insignificant observations, which all are spreading across our lives every day, more and more has come to become the next big thing, or small rather, of creating a part of differentiation for a brand an organization for a product or a service. The reality is that we, on the other hand, have completely forgotten about reality. I did a speech the other day in New York City for 3,000 executives, and I asked them a simple question. How many of you guys have spent time in a consumer home over the last one year? And two, not 2,000, two people raised their hand. The issue today is that we think fundamentally we can run the computer or the consumer via remote control. This is a quote from the chief marketing officer at Nestle. He said to me, Martin, 
when that remote control doesn't work for some reason, we change the battery, believing that we're even better at controlling our consumer, but we rarely get our hands dirty, move in with them and live with them, because they are us, because that's where the heartbeat is. As Benjamin Franklin once said, tell me and I'll forget, show me and I might remember and warn me and understand. We've forgotten the last line. We think we can talk at the consumer. We think we can analyze the heartbeat and emotions by remote control, but we rarely get engaged. And I guess that comes back to the evidence of an old worn down sneaker. Was in the end of the day, just one piece of evidence can turn around a company and hopefully can turn around mindsets about the importance of us being present again. Thank you.